Good evening. Welcome to Columbia at Home and tonight's program, Women in Wine. I'm Francine Glick, and I'm the co-chair of the Alumni Leadership Group and the She Opened the Door Initiative. She Opened the Door is pleased to co-sponsor this event as part of Women's History Month. The She Opened the Door Initiative, which began with a historic conference in New York City in 2018, aims to enlighten, educate, elevate, and to empower self-identifying women Colombians across the university. Please look forward to an official invitation for our upcoming all-day workshop titled She Opened the Door to Entrepreneurship, which will be on Saturday, April 30th, featuring a keynote by Barbara Roberts, a 2014 entrepreneur in residence at the Eugene Lang Center at Columbia Business School and a very successful entrepreneur in her own right. This program will also feature panel discussions led by successful alumni entrepreneurs throughout the Columbia community. I know you will thoroughly enjoy tonight's program with these smart and accomplished women. The only improvement would have to be this doing this in person and actually drinking the wine, maybe next time. Near the end of the program, we'll have a Q&A. Uh, you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. We'll try to get to as many as we can in the time we have. The panel tonight will be led by Ken Catandella, Senior Executive Director, CAA and University Relations and a co-founder of the CAA Wine Industry Network. I'm now very pleased to welcome Ken to Columbia at Home. Enjoy. Thank you, Francine. And thank you to She Opened the Door and the Alumni Leadership Group for co-sponsoring this evening with uh, the Columbia Alumni Association Wine Industry Network. The Wine Industry Network is comprised of more than 80 winemakers and winery owners that are Columbia alumni and hundreds of alums in other parts of the wine business. Uh, among the many things that the Wine Industry Network does is we curate the uh, CAA Virtual Wine Cellar. So please visit that, it was dropped in the chat for all of you. And now, without further ado, I'd like to bring this evening's panelists. Uh, we have folks joining us from near and far. So uh, starting with someone joining us on Thursday morning from Singapore, Amy Seo, who is um, a law grad and a founder of Raison Wines in Singapore. Welcome, Amy. Thank you very much, Ken. And joining us from Bonn in Burgundy, France, is Icy Lou, a 2005 C's graduate, and is with Be Becky Wasserman. Welcome, Icy. Thank you. Hi, everybody. And finally, my old friend, uh, joining us not from uh, the Rhone, but from London this evening, Nicole Rollet of Chen Bleu. Ken, so nice to see you. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. It's so great to have you here and to round out what's been uh, quite a wonderful month, Women's History Month uh, at Columbia and across the world. But tonight, we're going to focus on Columbia women leading the world of wine. And so uh, very briefly, we're gonna start off um, because this is the question we always get. Um, and a lot of the questions that came in beforehand were, uh, what did you do before you did this? Um, so Amy, before Raison Wines, um, what were you doing? Uh, I graduated law school and I was a disputes lawyer. So I used to do a lot of uh, commercial litigation international arbitration. Uh, I, I still do some law, to be honest. I haven't left the profession completely. It's, it's a fantastic profession. Um, it's, it's, you, you meet fantastic people. It's a very strategic profession and you learn a lot about human nature, uh, why people do the things they do, why people fight with the people that they do and why. Um, and I guess the reason why I decided to go into the wine industry, a lot of it is because I wanted to build something of my own. So I run a distribution company and I started it uh, with a business partner, but it's still uh, something that I have uh, conceptualized myself and something that you have, uh, I brought to life myself. So I think that feeling of satisfaction, that feeling of agency and direction is something that it's um, not so easy to obtain sometimes when working in a law firm. 
And the other reason why wine is because wine is a very tangible uh, product. I mean, it's, it's, it's right here. You can, you can smell it, you can taste it, you can share it with people in a way that you just cannot with very abstract, um, very ab the very abstract part of the floor. Okay, great, wonderful. Um, I see, from engineering to wine. Yeah, so I graduated um, from the engineering school in 2005. I worked in uh, finance, um, most, more specifically real estate finance before I moved to the wine in industry. Great, and Nicole. Oh, you're muted. Nicole, you're muted. There we go. There you go. Okay. Sorry about that. Beginner's mistake after all these years on Zoom. Uh, yeah, my background uh, was in international politics and finance. I studied international politics at, at Vassar and worked in, in think tanks and investment banks uh, until I happened upon this profession. I think I qualify as an accidental winemaker. It wasn't at all my dream. It was my husband Xavier's dream since forever. And he didn't have the means growing up. He was uh, at Columbia for career in finance, hoping that one day he could afford a vineyard. And he, he met me and he had just purchased it. I was a young single woman living in New York City, minding my own business, nothing but ketchup, stale milk in my refrigerator. I'm sure some people can relate to that. And soon after we met, he wanted to whisk me off to France and join him on his big adventure. And I loved wine, but I had never considered winemaking. I mean, my mother was a food critic. My father was a wine collector. So I had a good palate. But you can love shoes or watches, yet never even consider making them, right? So uh, they say love conquers all. And off I went to this uh, remote part of France. I think uh, some of you have uh, maybe been to Provence, and they might even have been to Chateauneuf-du-Pape if they like, like wine, but certainly not the uh, Vaucluse uh, region. So um, that was very, very discombobulating for me. And I said, I'll help you renovate the medieval priory on the estate, which has the water and electricity. And I figure I could wing that part compared to winemaking and viticulture. But as I learned more about the business, it began to fascinate me completely. And uh, I can really relate to what Amy was saying because my husband sent me to my first WCT course and I fell in love with it on the spot. Uh, I guess in hindsight, it was probably because I'm a geek and I did very well. I got this really good grade. I was like, oh, I love this stuff. Never looked back. So the plot twist is that I became the crazy deranged wine person, obsessed with winemaking, burning with desire to make Grand Cru quality in the middle of nowhere. And no one saw that one coming, not my mother, my husband, not even me. So uh, eventually I uh, sent him back to finance to pay for my vices. And if you had told me, even on our wedding day, that 20 years later, I would be living and breathing wine, I would never have believed you. And now every day I just pinch myself. I feel like I won the lottery by stumbling upon this amazing profession. Great. Um, and it's, it is an amazing profession, but um, it's not lost on me that it has been a profession that has been dominated by men for centuries. Um, and the, the nice thing about the Columbia Wine Industry Network um, is that I actually think we have more women uh, in the network than we do men, and that's a rarity. But you're all navigating uh, a male-dominated industry. And um, what is that like? And, and you know, we had a, a number of questions about how, you know, how do you navigate this? And I see I'm going to start with you this time. Yeah, so, um, you know, currently I work for a wine uh, exporter called um, Becky Wasserman and Company, and we are based in Bone, France. And you know, I, I, I look to uh, Becky was, uh, for those who might not be familiar, she's one of the um, pioneers of exporting Burgundian wines um, back in the 70s to, to the US. So she's one of the first people to do that. And um, I look to her a lot, you know, back then, um, would is definitely even harder um, than it is now, I imagine. Um, you know, she, when she first started her own company, um, she had to be accompanied by a man to open up her bank account, you know, so that has obviously changed a lot. So um, to me, it's just a, how to navigate. I kind of just, you know, uh, just keep my 
uh, my eye on the prize and kind of, you know, focus on um, bringing other women, other, when we talk about, you know, minorities in any industry, it's not just women for, for me, you know, it's also, um, you know, L, the LBGTQ community, you know, disabled people. So it's kind of sometimes when I'm um, in this industry, I kind of try to see who's around me and uh, what other people I can bring to my own community to um, do something worthwhile. So that's, that's for me. Great. Thank you. Nicole. Well, they say that in life as in love, timing is everything. So when I arrived in the wine business, there was just this tipping point happening. And in the south of France where we are, things were still really traditional. And here I show up, this sort of Park Avenue princess. And I really had a hard time identifying with the stereotypes of some of these big guys in their late 50s with the overalls and beret, who had just you know, little time for women and let alone younger wild American ones with zero track record. And I couldn't really blame them, right? I, the best they could say is maybe I was a friendly Martian that had landed in their vineyards like E.T. in the cornfields of California. And uh, they viewed me with this strange mixture of, of suspicion and just intrigue. But when I remember going to the London International Wine Fair, which in those days was a big deal, and I saw tons of women there uh, in commercial capacities. I even met some women running wineries. And I remember thinking it's just a matter of time for that mindset to trickle through to the winemaking side. So my grandmother had been a Boston suffragette, first woman this, first woman that. My mother had always been making a point of, of trying to be one of the first women in her field, mainly journalism. So I felt this obligation. It was sort of a responsibility to do my fair share of breaking glass ceilings. And I thought that this part of France was perfect for that. Uh, so when I worked in investment banking elsewhere, it was already very meritocratic. There were many opportunities for women at my level, at least. And uh, as long as you delivered the goods, people were promoting you and rewarding you. So I'm not one for confrontation or antagonism. And I soon realized that with the local vignerons, they just hadn't had much exposure to people like me. And it was mainly a question of leading by example. So I tried to divide and conquer. And then I invited them one by one to visit the winery, get to know our work, taste the wines. And they soon realized that we're all speaking the same language. It's sort of the, the universal language of appreciating fine wine. And that really helped a lot. Great. And Amy. Wonderful. So actually, I, I, I do have some similar observations to, to Nicole. I actually find in the wine industry, because I do importing and distribution, I actually find on the import side, um, many of the winemakers I deal with in France, or many of the companies, is actually pretty well represented on the woman front. So if it's a small, smaller winery, maybe it's a husband and wife team. Uh, if it's a bigger company, women are in leadership, or women are the ones who have inherited the winemaking um, business from their fathers and uh, their families. So I do see that, I don't know, maybe it's, it's a process of self-selection or uh, I'm a bit more drawn to women-led uh, companies, but I have found on the front side, on the supply side for me, there's actually been a pretty good representation. Um, what I would say is that perhaps on the, on the client side, so after I bring the wines back to Singapore and I distribute them here, uh, it's true there are a lot of men around in this industry. Um, many of the restaurant owners, business owners, uh, a lot of the SOMs um, are all guys. Um, they do fantastic jobs. I think maybe it's also the nature of the perhaps the F&B industry, um, which I know is probably a structural issue hours are long and it's not as conducive to family life sometimes. Um, but I find generally uh, gender has not been an, been, a, been an issue or a topic. It could be the people who came before me, the women who came before me and kind of broke ground and I stand on their shoulders um, and they have made it, um, representation is, is really not an issue at all. And um, I find I do maybe have to be a bit more firm sometimes, uh, but no, I, frankly, I find that it has not been uh, an issue or even something that has surfaced uh, in my work. Great. Okay. So before we get into wine, really get into wine, um, if you could each spend a minute, um, we've all had mentors. And if you could, you know, in a minute or so, uh, just talk about one of the most influential mentors to you. Uh, Nicole, we'll start with you this time. Can you hear me? Uh, 
Yeah, I, I guess I was lucky that very early on, we were introduced by close mutual friends to the amazing Zama Long. She's one of the top enologists in the world. She pioneered a lot of California winemaking, first woman to graduate from UC Davis, chief winemaker from Mondavi, back when he was trying to show the world that California could make world-class wines. Remember, that was uh, something that uh, took some convincing. Uh, it's hard to believe now. And uh, she went on to find, found several cult wineries. And by the time we met her, she had nothing left to prove, no enological merit left to be awarded, uh, James Beard, you name it. So our friends had vouched for us. And that was really lucky because I was able to convince her to come assess the potential of our terroir. So she was incredibly encouraging, but she also became a close mentor and a friend, uh, not just to me, but to all of us, including my amazing business partner, Laura Iverson, and our darling Danielle, who's Xavier's daughter, uh, joined us at the winery and hopefully gonna take over one day. So uh, Zelma was faced with much more incredulity and skepticism in her day than we would have been. So it's a lot like Amy was saying, uh, we really had it easy in many parts of the wine world. So you had to kind of look for pockets of resistance and go after them. Uh, so she developed this nickname, Ms. Oblivious, in reference to her philosophy of completely ignoring anyone's opinion on her gender and focusing only on making the best possible wine so that the proof would be in the pudding. And I think this was really sound advice. I mean, we all learn so much from her and uh, I certainly try to do that because it doesn't go with my personality. I'm very sensitive to other people's opinions. And I really had to put those blinders on and just focus on the wine on a number of occasions. And that was really good, good for me. Um, another incredible mentor has been the amazing Peter Sichel. He's another icon in the wine world. I hope you all get to know him. He's currently in his 90s, late 90s. Uh, if you haven't read his biography, The Secrets of My Life, Vintner, Prisoner, Soldier, Spy. I mean, this person has had an extraordinary uh, life story and I highly recommend that you're in for a treat. But I also think it's a reminder that you can be many things in your life and do them all well. And I think we try to be told that you can only do a few things to that high standard and having role models like that has been very useful for me. Oh, great, thank you. Amy. Sure, um, actually my, one of my most influential mentors, he was probably one of my first uh, bosses that I worked for in the legal industry. And I think the main thing I drew from him was his huge generosity of spirit. Uh, he is, because I guess when you're just starting off as a younger uh, person in your career, as much as I love wine, you're only limited to drinking a particular band of wines because that's mostly what you can afford. And I think what he really shared with us is um, his, he has this amazing collection of wine and he would, uh, you know, bring it out for dinners and kind of educate us about what exactly we are drinking, why we're drinking it, why it matches the occasion, the food, the company. And the important lesson I got out of that is that everything is a lot better when you share it, wine especially. It tastes different, the atmosphere is different, the conversation flows, the food matches the, um, the setting and the wine. And it's really that generosity of sharing and being with people, how to treat people well, how to uh, make them feel comfortable and how to and share the experiences and multiply it. I think that that really, um, I got a lot of, of, of that out of him. So I've learned a lot from him in law, in business, in wine, but most importantly, um, how, how to treat people and how, how to be generous with them. Very important lesson for me. Great, yeah, I agree on, on all counts. And I see. Yeah, I would say definitely my um, mentors would be, um, I have many mentors, but um, I would say um, definitely Becky Wasserman and her son, uh, Paul Wasserman, who is now the co-director of the company. I think what I learned from them the most is, you know, back in the um, 70s when um, Becky first started bringing uh, Burgundian wines to, to the US, um, one of the growers that she worked with from the beginning um, was uh, Fred Mounier. Um, he's a um, domain, uh, Fred Mounier in Chambon Mousny. And back then, you know, she uh, believed in Fred um, and Fred believed in his own wines, um, which at that time, um, it was an era in the 80s and 90s where a famous uh, wine critic called Robert Parker was very dominant. And his palate was more, um, you know, favoring the stronger and the more, I guess, 
bigger and extracted wine. And Fred always made wines that were more delicate. And that's also the palate that, um, you know, that drew Becky to, to the domain. So I think it's, um, and it took really 20 years for someone like Fred, who people complained that his wines were too, too light, too delicate. And now he's, you know, one of the most celebrated uh, growers in Burgundy. So it's really, um, he, you know, in this profession where um, for us, it's, you know, working with our domains and spreading, um, being their champions for, for um, the export world. And, um, you know, also it has taught me how to also look for the new generation of domains, you know, um, for someone like Fred, for other growers, you know, we um, try to spot them early on. And a lot of times the wines are not there yet. But what Becky and Paul has taught me is you um, you actually look at the person and their character and who they are um, will, you know, the wines will eventually get there. But you have to work with someone you believe in and who believes in what she or he is doing. So that has taught me a lot in this profession where we are still constantly trying to find new growers to work with. Um, yeah, so that has, um, among other things, that was one of the most important things that I've learned from them. Okay, um, and um, I'm going to uh, now stick with you for one second, Icy. Um, since this is Women's History Month, we're talking wine. Um, what is who would be one of your um, favorite or most noteworthy women winemakers, and why? Yes. So um, when I was work, when I was working um, in 2020, I had I worked two days a week with one of our growers called um, Tomoko uh, Kuriyama. Her domain is called Domaine Chantrev in uh, Savigny, and um, you know she it's uh, she's Japanese and her husband is um, it was the ex winemaker for um, Domaine Simon B's also in Savigny. But now they, um, he has quit that uh, job to kind of focus on their uh, domain full time. She would, uh, she would be my mentor because when I worked in the vines, um, you know, with her, she was always, um, you know, took time to explain to me what we did and why we did certain things. And um, most of all, she is, um, you know, she has been in wine um, for a long time making wine in Germany before she moved um, to France. And now she's in her fifties and she just started her, you know, buying, just bought her uh, her, or her own um, 4.7 hectares of vine. So yeah. she has influenced me in that, you know, I feel like you really can do anything um, at any age. And um, voila, she's uh, really one of my mentors just from her generosity of spirit and to, to be able to share and um, teach, you know, younger people like I'm not young but <laughs> younger people you know what you know how to farm um, vineyard with so much passion great Nicole the uh, the thing I see said that that really resonated is uh, this idea that you can also, do anything but but do it anywhere and and Zama Long and her husband Char and Phil Fries who's delightful and this inspirational guy Michael Radcliffe who if you haven't met him from South Africa he's a total rock star uh, they have proven to the world that South Africa can make Grand Cru quality by creating their vineyard Villa Fonte and it was just awarded best global wine producer of the year uh, in the International Wine and Spirits Competition. I mean, so exciting that just by being incredibly good at what you do, you can turn around the reputation, not just of a winery or even a region, but even a country. And you know, having South Africa win best red wine in the world, uh, just that is, is incredible. So uh, to Icy's point, I think it's really fun to see how, if you really believe in what you do, you can make it happen. Great, and before I go to you, Amy, I see somebody dropped in uh, Q&A, they missed the name of your mentor, if you wanna just repeat. In the uh, Chanterev? Yes. Yeah, so it's a C H A N T R E V E S, and you can definitely find the wines uh, all in in the U S. and other parts of the world as well. Great, thank you, Amy, your mentor. I'm sorry, your your winemaker. Oh, um, 
yeah, I guess continuing the theme of um, doing anything you want and doing it anywhere. Actually, I'm going to give a historical, a, a historical answer. Um, it's actually uh, the Champagne Widow Verve Clicquot. And I find her story amazing and fascinating. Obviously, I've never met her. But um, I think what she has done to revolutionize her own business, the champagne industry, have lasting effects in the way uh, champagne is consumed and marketed around the world. Those are amazing. So she was widowed at the age of 27, unfortunately. But she then went to her father-in-law and said, hey, I have a proposal for you. Why don't I take over your winery, do an apprenticeship, learn about how to make wine, and um, she had to convince quite a few skeptical people to get there. But when she did, she just created so much change and so much, um, so, so many innovations. She was the one who invented the process of um, riddling to make sure that the leaves come down to the neck of the bottle so you can expel them. Uh, she also marketed a champagne to Russia, the US. Uh, she was a real dynamic force. And I think that's, that's, a kind of, that's a kind of story. That's the kind of personal dynamism and energy and vision that I think it's really, it's really inspiring. So I, I do wish I had a, a live um, uh, opportunity to, I guess, see how she operated, but uh, well, we'll just live on in her stories. Okay. And I'm going to jump in here for the first time. Um, my uh, winemaker is a Colombian. Um, Julie Johnson graduated the nursing school in 1979 and was one of the first winemakers, women winemakers in the Napa Valley. And um, she has, um, in, in an area where everything is rarefied, um, she has a, um, a sustainable organic farm. Uh, her ecosystem is remarkable. Uh, the wines are remarkable. Um, and um, she's very principled. And so, um, you know, she has really stuck by her guns um, in, in, a, in, in an area where, you know, it, it, it's hard to do. Um, but um, if you ever have the opportunity and you're in Rutherford, uh, Trey Saborth and uh, Julie is um, what I like to call my West Coast Nicole. Um, they, they sort of have the same mindset when it comes to winemaking and sustainability. So that's mine. All right, now we're going to get into the fun stuff. So a lot of your questions were about um, wine and the characteristics of wine. And Nicole taught me a very fun exercise on how to sort of demystify, you know, the characteristics of wine varietals uh, by assigning them um, actual people. And so uh, we're going to do a little round robin of our first our whites and then our reds and who the historical or cultural figure uh, is um, that you would uh, would most align with the characteristics of the varietal. So Nicole, I think you're going to start us off on the whites. So go ahead. Well, I um... I'm a Riesling girl, so I find it very approachable. It's versatile, it's great in its youth. You don't have to be a great connoisseur to enjoy it. Um, but to wine snob, sometimes it seems a bit easy to dismiss it or underestimate it or complain that it's too sweet or, or it's flabby or something like that. But then it turns out that it's not just a pretty face. It ages with grace. It acquires complexity, nuance without losing its youthfulness. And that made me think of Goldie Hawn because she's sweet and welcoming when you meet her. She's easy to approach. I met her once and she was very smiley and warm. Great person with a heart of gold. But it turns out that she has dimension to her. She won an Academy Award. She fights for really important causes. She has staying power. She's now Hollywood royalty. She ages well. She's still full of that vim and vigor and beloved in her old age, but she's not a faded beauty very confident on stage and in the wider community, generous, doing a lot for others. So I love that aspect of Riesling, that it's a sort of gift that keeps giving. Great. Great. Amy. Uh, for, oh, okay. Right. So for whites, one of my favorite grapes is um, Chenin Blanc um, from the Loire, from South Africa. It's a fantastic grape. It's versatile. You can make so many styles out of it, sparkling, dry, sweet, semi-dry. You literally can have an entire wine pairing dinner with, with Shannon. Um, 
So the woman I've chosen uh, that I think really represents Shenan for me is actually Simone Biles, the US gymnast, because she's sparkling. She's very sweet. And I think we all saw that uh, during the recent uh, Olympics. Uh, she's very versatile on the apparatus, every apparatus. And she's also the greatest of all time. So one of my favorite grapes, Shanan. So I would very much like to associate that with her. Great. And I see. Uh, so I have picked um, a grape called um, Alagote. In Burgundy, the main grapes, uh, red grape is Pinot Noir and the white grape is Chardonnay. But most, uh, a lot of people um, forget that there is another wonderful grape called Alagote. Um, the reason why I like Alagote is because if you um, really give the love and the uh, great farming and plant it in, um, um, you know, the uh, good spots, it can really sparkle. It has a ton of energy. It has, it's really mineral and um, it's a, there's a grower that we work with called Sylvan Patai and he has um, four different a single vineyard um, alagotes, and they taste very different. They're planted in different soils and different ter terroirs. Um, and I like it and um, for its freshness and um, oftentimes Sylvan Patai will taste, you know, his alagotes after the Chardonnays. And um, I um, associate alagote with um, Tinkerbell because um, Tinkerbell is um, so, it's kind of like a sidekick to, um, you know, it's just a side in general, but like, you know, with um, uh, her pix pixie dust and when you think wonderful thoughts, just like Alagote, when you put, put them in actually good terroirs, they can fly and can really blossom. So that would be my analogy, Alagote. Okay, great. Um, I went with uh, Gravurtstraminer and for me, it is the most unique grape in that it it, it is, it's sensual uh, in, in the sensory uh, sort of way. It's the aromas, uh, the, the hues, um, the, just the flavor palette. And um, it, it just speaks to me. Um, I, I feel like um, it's the most alive wine in a glass. And, um, and I thought long and hard about, you know, who represents that. And I came up with um, the French novelist, uh, Colette, um, because when you, you, know, you think of her writing, um, she's so exacting when it comes to the senses, uh, to smells, to taste, to texture. And Gavroch Demeanor has an interesting texture. And so uh, I, I, I analogize um, Gavroch Demeanor with Colette. Now on to Reds and Nicole, you're gonna start us off. I love that, Ken. Uh, and uh, following on, on the versatility that uh, Icy was talking about, obviously, I am going to go straight for my Grenache. I'm a Grenache gal, a hardcore Grenachista. Uh, and Grenache is the unsung hero of the wine world. It's beloved to winemakers, little known to consumers. But one of the reasons is that it's hard sometimes to, to know what to expect. Uh, because it's so versatile and it typically will taste of red fruit. It can be soft and cheerful and friendly, but it can also be dark and complex and brooding and full of nuance and, and everything in between. And that's because it has that ability to change in response to the terroir and to the winemaking and has a high beta, as we would say in finance. And that's why I'd say it, it would be the quintessential method actor, which is the kind that really takes on a role, totally morphs into that character, studies it, and really responds to nuance. And it allows you to learn so much about the whole microcosm around them, right? So not just the character, but everything else that tells a, a great story. Um, of course, that made me think of Meryl Streep. I mean, she's so famous for that. Uh, Grenache is um, called the midwife of terroir for that ability to transmit the, the taste of the place it's from and that vision of the person who handled it. So it's a great, great to graduate to the next level of wine tasting, uh, which is to start traveling to different terroirs through nuance and taste in wine. And of course, for me, when we talk about Meryl Streep, you know, she's my heroine. She went to Vassar like me, she spoke at my graduation, uh, but she's virtually unrecognizable from film to film. And sometimes even in the same film, I don't know if you ever saw Angels in America, but 
wow, that she was, I think, playing seven roles in that or something. And she's always pitch perfect for the role. And I think that Grenache, when it's well handled, can really rise to that occasion. So that's going to get my book. Okay. I see. Um, my gr uh, red grape would be um, grape that I'm not sure if people have heard from the southwest um, in an area called Fonton called Negret, Negret Punjou. Um, and there was a question, um, you know, in the Q&A about has climate change, um, you know, affected um, our choices. And I would say absolutely. I, that's also why I chose Alagote, because, you know, in this day of climate change where freshness and acidity um, is something we really, at least for my palate, I really uh, search for. Um, you know, Negret Punju is a, um, a, a grape that is um, in the Southwest that is um, uh, not very well known because people kind of have abandoned it, uh, abandoned it except for a, a grower we work with called um, uh, Domaine Plaisance Penarver, who um, kind of uh, brought it back um, from close to extinction. And the reason why I, I chose it is because it's it's a red grape, but it uh, gets ripe at 11% uh, uh, alcohol. So, um, you know, it's for me at the end of the day, you know, while I love tasting, you know, uh, you know, other wines, um, maybe a little heavier, but like this, just at the end of the day, if you want something just really um, tasty and very refreshing, you know, you can find this kind of um, olive tapenade, um, uh, uh, a little uh, dark, a dark red grape with um, a lot of freshness. Um, and I um, associate this grape to uh, Lara Croft, you know, who's like a treasure hunter. And, you know, I think with climate change, um, you know, it's it's very important for us to not just always gravitate towards, um, you know, varieties that we know and maybe uh, forgotten varieties that have worked very well in the past, but just uh, somehow has gone um, forgotten. So that's what um, I chose. Great. Um, Amy. Yeah, so my my red grape uh, is one of, it's actually my personal favorite. It's Syrah, uh, Shiraz in Australia, Syrah in France. Uh, I've chosen the French version. Uh, Syrah is, to me, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful grape. It's very big, flavor-packed, um, can be very brash when it's young. If you control the, extract, the extraction and you leave it to age for a bit while, it produces so elegant, um, legendary, storied wines, Cote Roti, Amitage, uh, from the Rhone. Um, so what I have chosen is actually a, a, another athlete, uh, Serena Williams. She's bold. She was a bit brash when she was young. Um, she's really powerful. Um, and she's also slightly peppery on the finish, which I think is something that adds a little bit of edge, something that adds a little bit of interest uh, to the wine and very, very aromatic and very, she's, you know, maturing and she has matured into a very elegant, very graceful tennis player. So that's, that's my pick. Okay. So I'm going to stay on the peppery side. Uh, I chose Cabernet Franc. And um, there is, and for me, there, there's the duality of an earthiness, but then a spiciness to it, particularly as it, um, you think about it as a single varietal in the Loire Valley, um, but it can be so refined. I think about Chevelle Blanc um, in uh, Bordeaux or Dumani in um, Tuscany. Um, and, and so it, it has that, great duality. And so I thought about somebody who um, could be both um, earthy and spicy. Um, and it really came down to um, musical taste. So I picked someone from the Loire Valley. Um, her name uh, is Isabella Geoffrey, um, but better known as Zaz. Um, and uh, she, uh, it is an elegant, elegant singer, um, but she also uh, thrives on performing in the streets. And so um, you can see her in uh, a concert hall one day and the next afternoon she's on the streets of Paris or tour. And so that's who I went with. Um, and so now we're getting really, we're getting a bunch of questions. And so the last thing I'm gonna ask each of you is if you could be any bottle of wine, what would it be and why? Let's try to do this one pretty quickly. 
So, um, Icy, I'm going to start with you. Um, if I could be any bottle of wine, um, do we have to stay with the, the same uh, ones that we chose before? Or? No, not, absolutely not. Um, if I could be any a bottle of wine, I would be um, maybe a 1991 Alagote from Domaine Rouleau. It's the oldest Alagote I've ever tasted, and it aged ages really well, um, and I hope I will age very well as well. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's again, it's a grape that you know people don't pay a lot of attention to, but um, it's a very tasty wine. Okay, um, Nicole. I'm gonna go with uh, my Eloise because uh, like Amy, I, I love my Syrahs as well as my Grenache. And this wine is um, my Syrah blend that has a little bit of Grenache in it. So it's really serious and age worthy. It's named after this very famous uh, woman who was the 12th century companion to Abelard, the most famous French lovers. And I love that she has sort of persistence, poise, and some softness, umami with the Grenache to make it approachable. And this unexpected splash of Roussan at the end, a little 5%, 3% depends on the vintage. So it's a bit of a think outside the box wild card that dares to be different. And I love that about this wine that she has this very classic style, but then the, that, uh, the little uh, wild card. So in real life, Eloise combined emotional, spiritual, intellectual, managerial ability. And even today, she'd be a showstopper with all of that. And I, I really wanted a wine that had a lot going on and kind of packed it all in. Okay, Amy. Wonderful. Uh, I would be probably an appellation, not a specific bottle. I would be Cote Roti, I hope. Um, and again, it's my favorite grape, Syrah. And also I think it's kind of, it comes from a small slope, a uh, small hill that is self-contained. Uh, very, very hot conditions. Cote Roti is the roasted slope. Um, and then at the same time, when you have the bottle and you open it, the aromas that come out of it are just fascinating. And they go on and on and on forever. So in a way, perhaps I, I, maybe that is something that I would like to, to, to embody to come from a, from a place that, you know, really bakes you into those conditions and then come out to, to flourish and to, to be very uh, perfumed. That's, that's something that I like. Okay. Um, I'm going with 1961 uh, Chateau Lynch Bage uh, because my father bought a case uh, the year I was born, 1961. And um, when I turned 12, that was the first full bottle of wine that I had ever had. Um, and so uh, I decided if I uh, took that case and had one every 12 years, I would live to be 144. Uh, but I'm not quite sure I want to live that long, so I may rush it a little bit towards the end. Um, but with that, I want to open it up. We got lots of questions. And so um, the first question um, is for you, Icy. Where does the best Chablis come from? Um, you mean who makes the best Chablis or? I, yeah, I, I, I guess I'm not sure if that's the question, uh, mm -hmm. um, but let's, so if you, let's just um, let everybody know that Chablis is actually a region, the grape is Chardonnay, but if you, if it, if in fact the question is about um, the best Chablis, if, uh, where would I, what, what would you say would be? Uh, either the village. Yeah, or... there is a lot of um, good growers. You know, there are two um, famous growers. Um, um, I would say um, there's, uh, um, you know, one of my favorite, I, I know it's kind of, people always say it, but they're, they're very good is um, Dovisa is, um, you know, one of the best growers. We work with someone called Jean-Claude Bessin who's also very good. And I think um, if you, you know, go to a wine store in any, you know, I think what's really nice is um, if you do enjoy wine and you do live in the city where you can have access to, to wine stores and if you have a rapport with the people who um, work there, they can probably recommend something to you that's, um, that's very good. And there's, you know, obviously excellent wine made from Chablis. Yeah, okay. Um, Amy, um, do you have any suggestions for people who want to transition into the wine industry and where should they start? Hmm. 
and suggestions. Uh, frankly, just just start. That is the the best piece of advice I can give. I, I think the um, I, I'm not sure if this is, is is reflective of most people, but I find that the more time I spend thinking and deliberating and um anticipating something, uh, that process always takes longer and is always a bit more fraught than actually just 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 doing it. Uh, I think where to start is a very difficult place. I I I. I fully um, empathize with that sort of struggle. And one thing I did was I actually did the WSET3 course to give myself a structured grounding in wine. Because as much as you know as a casual consumer, uh, nothing can beat a structured, formal sort of way of thinking about it and approaching wine. Um, and I think in the early days when you have decided which aspect of the wine industry you want to go into, uh, there's a lot of talking to people to figure out where you could fit in. And there's also a lot of knocking on people's doors and cold calling. I think that part of the experience cannot be done away with. Um, you just have to go through that phase of just first deciding that you're going to do it, um, just taking the plunge, and then just knocking on those doors, just bowing your head and just pushing your way through. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think just having the resolve and the, the, the determination and knowing that that's going to happen will probably set you up a bit more for, for that to happen. Great. Um, so, Nicole. Are winemakers going to start including alcohol-free products or low-alcohol wines as people are becoming more health conscious? Uh, and as I uh, note the high alcohol content of uh, some of your reds, so. Yeah, you're probably the third person this week to ask me that question uh, because it is on the tip of many tongues right now. Uh, and, uh, and I did discuss it with Zelma Long when she was last there because I I know that some people would would like to be enjoying our, our wines and not having to think about the alcohol. Unfortunately, in the winery, anytime you try to take the alcohol out, you're really, really changing the nature of the wine, this, the molecular structure of it. I would not be the right person to start with that process because we are exactly doing the opposite. We're spending ridiculous amounts of time in the vineyard and in the winery, not doing anything interventionist to our grapes. And therefore, um, it, it's so it's such a process. I think if you it's like a bit like decaf coffee, purists are horrified when they find out all the things that has to be done to that coffee bean to take the the caffeine out of it so um probably the commercial wineries will be better placed mm -hmm. to to make uh, those kinds of wines because they're already tinkering so much with their grapes with additives and you know stripping things out and adding things in and it's like Photoshop for wine these days in the in the commercial wineries. There's so many enological products available, yeah. so it would probably be better suited to people who who are happy to uh, change the very nature of the raw material as much as it would have to be done to take the alcohol out. Okay, um, this one's for everybody. Um, what is the most important sense of your senses that you need to appreciate wine? Um, Amy, I'll start with you. Uh, so I guess smell will be an obvious one um, because that is what aroma is all about. But I actually think there's an underappreciated point that Ken, I thought you brought out really nicely in your analogy to the author Colette, it's texture. Because something that comes across on your palate, it can come in very sharp on your tongue or it can spread or it can fill your mouth or it can bring in a lot of acidity from the back. And I think those are aspects that um, I guess the average, con you know, I mean, the average wine drinker may not um, be so uh, conscious of or sensitive to, because we focus so much on smell, 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 what can you smell on the glass, uh, but it's a huge sensory um, uh, experience, wine, and I think we need to have a bit more attention to other parts of it, like texture. Anybody disagree? <laughs> Okay, good. Then I'm going to go to the next question. Um, if I want to start learning about wine, where's the best place to go? Um, so, um, Icy, you've done you've done retail, you've done so many different things, um, and I, I think you alluded to it a little earlier about you know making building relationships in local wine shops. Yeah, I mean, I think depending on um, like uh, Amy said, 
you know, maybe, you know, WSAT, I think really provides a good uh, framework, um, even just starting from level two or level three. Uh, I don't think level one is necessary, but just, um, you know, I think those uh, WSAT would be pretty um, provided, you know, worldwide. So I think for me, that's uh, what I did. And I think that is helpful. I personally, I like a more structured kind of studying kind of uh, um, place. And there's also just good books. Like there's also just like the Karen McNeil Wine Bible is a, a book that a lot of people start with. And it really gives you a good basic um, knowledge as well. So I think books and also um, tasting, I think it's very important to taste and um, just to figure out, you know, what you like and why you like it. So you can, um, you know, anytime you go to a, a retail store, or anytime you go to a restaurant, to be able to communicate that. Um, WSCT provides some of the vocabulary. But yeah, as, as, as I said earlier, maybe, you know, at the retail shop, like start talking to salespeople, like, and just figuring out what you like and why you like it. Okay. Would be Great, and um, I'm just going to throw in. There's a there's something called a certified wine specialist. It's a great overview. I, I saw Jeff Franklin on this uh, engineering class of '68. I know he's a certified wine consult uh, a wine specialist. Nicole, you want to jump in on this, and then we're gonna we're gonna roll right into our toast. So go ahead. Absolutely. So uh, I completely agree with Amy and Icy that. Uh, the WCT level two is transformational. Uh, you have to take the two, but it rolls the one into the two. So you don't have to take the one. Don't bother with that. You can't take the three without the two. Uh, but those are uh, such important courses. And um, to the point where we created at the winery, a wine school, which we're, it's called Extreme Wine. And <clears throat> we teach it specifically to help people who are not in the wine trade to become extremely conversant in a very short amount of time. So I'll give you the information for that. And it's, it rolls in WCT2 in a proprietary degree. It's taught by Clyde Barlow, chairman of education at the Institute of Master of Wine. And there is, there's no faster way to really uh, transform your wine knowledge, whether beginner, intermediate, or advanced. Great. Um, okay, so we've reached that point where, um, as is tradition in all of our wine webinars, uh, we end by toasting uh, all of you. And um, so I'm going to ask each of you to tell me what's in your glass. Um, and then we will um, share a toast with um, all the folks from all over the world who joined us this morning, this afternoon, or this evening. Um, so, um, Amy, let's start with you. Sure. This is my breakfast wine, actually, um, because it's something like eight o'clock in the morning right now. Um, so this is actually, a, I, have, I have the bottle right behind me. It's um, a burgundy producer that we started to work with uh, recently, uh, Seguin Manuel. And uh, it's a Poma from the vineyard called Petit Noir Zone. So it's a Pinot Noir in the glass. And I think it's, it's just a right sort of light start to the day for me. Okay, great. And Nicole? This is my sweet dreams wine. It's um, one o'clock in the morning here. And uh, it's my Syrah Eloise, which I um, love to take to bed with me because she's really aged with grace. And I hope that uh, I'll be able to follow the same trajectory. <laughs> so it's a reminder that uh, good things come if you stay the course. Okay, I see. Um, I finished this earlier today, but um, I have a um, 1996 Michel Lafarge uh, Volnay Claude de Chen. That's also one of the first producers that Becky started uh, working with back in the back in the day. So yeah, it's a, a Volnay from um, Burgundy. Okay, great. And I am uh, going with an, a um, North Fork wine. Uh, the winemaker is. Um, a, a young Mexican winemaker, uh, Lilia Perez, and um, she learned her craft in Bordeaux. And this is a white Bordeaux blend from RGNY owned by um, a Columbia alumna, um, Maria Rivero Gonzalez. So I tried to keep it all in the family. So with that, let's raise our glasses. Uh, I toast, first of all, the three of you for 
getting up early and staying up late. Um, and to all of you who let us into your homes and hopefully into your wine glasses, uh, we wish you good health uh, and look forward to doing this with all of you in person in the not too distant future. So, um, and join us the next, um, okay. Um, Nicole, what are you drinking? Your, it was some, someone's asking what your, what your wine is in the glass. It's a 2007 Eloise, which was our second vintage ever. And uh, 15 years on, it's really alive and kicking. Okay, and join us on uh, Wednesday the 6th for the next Columbia at Home um, with Phil Groden and um, uh, its soft life skills. So, uh, salud um, to good health. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much, all Ken. for sharing. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, uh, Thank you for sharing the stage with me this evening. Thank you. Salud. Thank you.